my 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 we're gonna wait at least for one or two to um, show up is 11 15 praise the Lord hallelujah amen it's a good day to uh, to belong to Jesus Lola Lola blessings and whoever else is there we're gonna start in a moment and um, this is our second day of um, fast and prayer as we um, end up the month of prayer for September and it's been an amazing um, experience and um, social media is fantastic uh, how you can reach so many people out there anyway uh, so as we're waiting for uh, maybe one more on that um, don't forget today we're we'll be talking about the next generation or young people or youth and praying for them and um, because you know that that's the next generation that the enemy is really attacking uh, because the enemy doesn't want um, young people today that will bring the blessings of God tomorrow and uh, we need to look at some uh, dangers that that we can do so anyway today's our day 29th tomorrow is our last day of the month uh, day 30th and tomorrow we'll be talking about unforgiveness resentment all the things that we can hold in our hearts as Christians and, uh, and block the blessing of the Lord and how we need to release and understand what forgiveness really is uh, from the Word of God and um, from uh, my experience as well so um, and then today I, uh, I encourage everybody to pray for um, the um, US elections today is the first debate between the Democrats and the Republicans and uh, how do we pray about that, Brother John? Well, just like we did last Saturday uh, at the prayer meeting, and that was, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, so, you know, it's not that, you know, we support one about the other. If we want God's will, you know, we can have our preferences. There is nothing wrong, but we have to look at the... Um, uh, at what the parties stand for you know and uh, and you know we want to make sure that they're pro-life and pro word of God and all of that good stuff but uh, my, the biggest prayer that we can pray for them is thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so um, and you know and sometimes we'll be surprised by the decisions of the Lord uh, and the reason that we got to pray thy will be done because you know man is not in control you have to understand that God is always in control I mean I look back when we had our own elections over here and a lot of Christians wanted to go one way the others in a different way and um, and I and I felt you know the day before or something like that and I remember at, a, at one of our meetings probably I recorded that meeting and I said you know I think that we're going to be disappointed, <laughs> right? So sometimes it will not go the way we want it to go if we pray only for one party. Um, but if we pray for God, thy will be done. You know, the Bible says, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth. So um, I think that um, that's the way we need to pray for Canada and for the U.S., so I'm going to include that prayer as we open up today before we go into the next generation and um, for God's will to be done. And um, one thing that I'm going to pray for the debate today in the U.S. is that the true colors will manifest of both parties, of both parties, so that the world and U.S. can see the true colors of uh, both parties and, uh, and for people to vote wisely but most of all that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven 
and I pray that we will not be disappointed, <laughs> some of us, and uh, in the direction. But you know, we could be disappointed. Uh, it's a very small percentage. A lot of people says that we, you know, we could be disappointed. <laughs> That's the reason that it's better not to be disappointed. But I believe with all my heart that, um, and I said it about a month ago, two months ago, I believe that uh, we won't be disappointed and I believe that we're going to have a, a four year of grace uh, to preach the gospel because whatever happens in the U.S., Canada and Israel will affect us as a nation here in Canada. So I encourage you to uh, be praying for these three nations and for Canada. So let's open up in prayer for today. Father God, right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you that you are an amazing God, a wonderful God. And I ask, Father, that you will have your way here, God, as we pray for um, for the next generation. Oh, we need to pray for them and in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that you have given me a different angle how to approach this. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, something that the Word of God wants us to be aware of uh, for the children and uh, for the next generation. So, Father, you anoint me, and the um, Holy Spirit is your, is your word. Uh, help me to deliver that which you want to say and uh, deliver it well. Give me divine wisdom and understanding. Use my experiences from the past. Use the insights that you have given unto me. And I pray, God, that you will minister to us, that we may be able to pray wisely today for the next generation. And, Father God, we, um, we pray for the U.S. for the debate today. Uh, that is going to go there. So I want to pray, Father, that your will will be done today. And Lord, that you will expose the true callers of both parties, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And Father, that people will not vote just for voting, you know, whatever their friends vote. But Father, I pray that Christians will vote and people will vote, oh God, for... Um, for safety, for democracy, and not not socialism and all of that stuff, Father. So bring the true colors of both parties there and help the world, help U.S., uh, the citizens there, Father, be able to um, vote wisely and be able to see um, clearly what your will is, oh God, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, that I don't believe that this is the hour for um, to get closer to the rapture. I believe that your mercy endures forever, and I believe that that the gospel must be preached throughout the whole earth, and then the end will come. So I believe that we are going to have a moment of grace for a few years, and I ask Father that you will just have your way tonight. We uh, review call the forces of hell in the name of Jesus Christ. And whatever the the enemy has planned, that it will be that it will backfire, in the name of Jesus. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And Father, I pray God that when you know when people seem that you have lost control, you have not lost control, not at all, Lord. <laughs> you are an amazing God. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You're the everlasting God. You're the Emmanuel. God is with us. Lo, I am with you right to the end. I will never leave you nor forsake you nor fail you. So you are in control. But sometimes your decisions are contrary to the way we want things. But I believe, God, that you will prevail in this hour. And it's in your plans to give us a moment of grace to continue to preach the gospel through the, throughout the whole earth. In Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, come now as we talk about the subject of uh, the next generation. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you will give us wisdom and understanding about this. And, um, and we just commit this. You know, we submit ourselves to you and we resist the forces of hell. We come against the spirit of witchcraft. Uh, we, we come against the spirit of the Antichrist. We come against the Jezebel spirits and every near spirit that will stand against the word of God in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. So bless you. Uh, thank you for joining me now and for those that will join later. 
It's been an amazing month, and uh, God has spoken to me about social media, so we're going to expand a little bit um, social media. And it's amazing. Why Why am I so confident about expanding social media? Because, you know, I, I, I have seen uh, the Holy Spirit move. You know, I have seen the Holy Spirit minister. So I don't want to hinder that part. And I want to make sure that I'm in the right standing with the Lord and be able to um, to bring His Word um, to our region and to uh, different nations. I mean, we have, um, we have uh, you know, like I said, Philippines, Africa, Pakistan, India, Canada. I mean, from one corner to another, we have people that listen to us and they send me messages. And we have locals here from Atlantic Canada as well. So, um, uh, you know, we're reaching people. And uh, I mean, I can tell you story, story, but we have a subject to, to talk about. Anyway, I, I want to read a portion of scripture that, uh, for those that know me, I read this before, but um, this is very scary, okay? And, uh, and if we're going to pray for the next generation, we have to, um, we have to look at the scripture and in order for us to pray wisely and correctly, according to the word of God. So I, this is found in uh, Matthew chapter 18. And that's when the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, <laughs> who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is going to be the greatest Lord? You know, isn't that amazing, you know? I mean, you know, we, we, uh, we uh, sense the power of God, the presence of God. We, uh, we have all of that. And, uh, and yet, you know, we're, the flesh kicks in and he says, you know, who wants to be <laughs> the greatest in the kingdom of God? So anyway, but if you've been listening and following our ministry, I mean, uh, you can tell, uh, I mean, I come, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit uses me to come down against those, those things, idolatry and uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the entertainment in the church, and uh, we have fallen away from preaching Christ and, uh, and His Word. So, uh, but here, you know, the flesh all the time, you know, Lord, who's going to be the greatest, you know? You know, let's just be thankful that your name could be in the book of life you know let's be thankful for that because that's that's a huge one you know i mean it's not who's going to be the greatest but is my name in the book of life you know am i going to endure to the end you know he that endures to the end shall be saved so the opposite is he that doesn't endure to the end will not be saved you know you have to understand that that's 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 common sense of understanding the scriptures and then he says you know that we're called to what finish the race we start but we finish many start and then they they fall down but that's okay god can pick them up and god can restore them and uh, and keep going and that's what happened to me you know I, we start well and then boom 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 you know we get head left right and center we're knocked down you know and uh, when we're knocked down that's when uh, the break-ins come and then that's when the Lord is able to, um, to use us more effectively. And uh, there is less of us and there is more of him. And sometimes, you know, it's hard for us to, to decrease, you know, just like the disciples over here, you know, they came to Jesus and they said, you know, who's going to be the greatest? So they were not really decreasing because if they were really broken, okay, if they were really broken, you know, they wouldn't ask that question, you know, because, you know, if I, if I, if I make it to heaven, if I endure to the end, you know, that's good enough for me. I don't care what happens after that, because after that, we're going to be uh, with him for eternity. You know, the Bible says that this is life eternal, that they might know him and the only true God and Jesus Christ, who, whom thou hast sent. So, I mean, you know, that, that's the most awesome part is that we're gonna, we know him uh, and Jesus here on earth. And, uh, you know, and we say, Lord. You know, thank you that you have given us the opportunity for us to live with you forever and ever and ever and ever. So let's continue, okay? In the scriptures, uh, verse 2, he says, So he called a little child and set him before them and said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless you repent. I love the word repentance. I love the word repentance. Imagine, that's the thing that we have to love in this hour. And that's why last Saturday when I saw the, uh, the Americans there in Washington and everybody sharing testimonies and everything like that, and they call it their return. 
you know, and uh, as you know, yesterday uh, over the weekend it was Yom Kippur. It was a day of atonement, and uh, and I have never in a long time heard so much repentance, 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 repentance over the past uh, weekend, especially Saturday, as uh, Christians pray in Washington, and uh, they were calling everybody back to God. In repentance, so you know, I love it whenever uh, I, I read a scripture and, and repentance is there. I mean, it's amazing because that's the key to revival. That's the key for heaven to be to be released upon your home, your life, your marriage, um, your business, whatever. That's the key is repentance, and then the Bible says fruits of repentance. Right. So we don't only repent, <laughs> but now we got to show the fruits. You know, I seen, um, I seen uh, last year we saw a big preacher repent in front of everybody, but we didn't see the fruits, right? So what happens? We can repent and no fruits. Wait a minute. So that's not true repentance. Repentance must have fruits, right? I mean, you know, myself, you know, when I when I repented, <laughs> you know, there was fruits. There was a, tra a transformation. There was a change. In my life so he says I assure you and most solemnly say to you unless you repent that is change your inner self I love the amplify change your inner self your own way of thinking right so change your inner self your own way of thinking live change lives and become like little children how? Trusting, humble, and forgiven. He says, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I didn't say that. God did. Okay? And, and we're going to get to the subject of praying for the next generation. But over here it says, it says, you know, uh, become like them. You know, your old way of thinking. Life changed lives. And become like little children. How? trusting, humble, forgiven. He says, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then verse four, he says, therefore, whoever humble himself like this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, they're asking for a question there. He says, you know, who's going to be the greatest? And here Jesus gives them the, uh, the answer. He says, if you want to be the greatest, you got to become like a little child. You got to become humble, forgiven, uh, trusting, you know, and uh, and he says, you know, and uh, if you do this, and if you welcome, he says, oh, no, whoever humbles himself like this little child is greatest in the kingdom. So, you know, my advice to all of us is that we don't become humble, trusting and forgiven because we want to be the greatest. That, that, that you know, that will not happen. <laughs> Because if that's your um, your heart, your agenda, to be the greatest, and so you're willing to to be trusting, humble, and forgiven, to be the greatest, then then you'll never be the greatest, because that will be a wrong agenda, a hit agenda in your life for the for you to be greatest, and that's not what Jesus is saying over here. Because when you are humble, forgiven, and trusting, you're a broken vessel, right, and then and then you're. You're humble to say, God, I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve your love. You know, the Bible says that he gives us that which we don't deserve. The Bible also says that man has nothing good in themselves but that which comes from above. So, you know, when we're humble, trusting, and forgiven, you know, it's not that we take pride in how humble we are, but we take pride and we take, we, we, yeah, we can take pride in how much God is in us and how much he loves and how, and how much he has given us what we don't deserve. But now we're going to get to the topic, okay? Praying for a next generation. And I'll give you a few thoughts, then we're going to pray because that, if you have kids, no matter how old they are, Right? You need to hear this. So he says, whoever receives, verse 5, he says, whoever receives and welcomes one child like this in my name receiveth me. 
Oh my God. My God. I would love to have the Lord, you know, knock on my door and uh, and say, will you receive me, John? But over here he says, if you welcome one of these children, you welcome me. So, you know, he's trying to give us the importance of the next generation. You see, God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's always thinking of tomorrow. Whatever we sow today, we will reap. And that's one thing that the world, I'll say this, the world has forgotten. That whatever we sow, we reap. The world has forgotten in what's important for our future as a nation, as a world. And then we have the power as parents in this hour to change or to add to the course of the way the world is going. And that's one thing that even Christians don't understand. The world, some of them, they do. Imagine, some, of, some people in the world, they do. Most, they don't. And what we're experiencing today with politics and uh, pandemic and all of the things that are taking place, we're forgetting about the most precious thing that God has given us our children. And if you don't have a child, that's okay. There's many children out there to adopt. There's many children probably in your church that you can minister to. There's many children out there. Why? Because, listen, because when you invest in them, you're receiving Christ. Because when you're investing in them, you're investing in the next generation and in the future of this nation, in the future of your city, because you're concentrating in them. Isn't it amazing that we live in an era that social media has really taken over? And unfortunately, many, many of us, Christians and non-Christians, we are neglecting one of the most precious things that God has given to this world, children. That's why we have to be pro-life. You know, that's the reason that a lot of communism, communist countries they just want babies and babies and babies and babies and babies because they want to control the world. They want to make the world a one world government and they want to control most of it. Here in North America, we're pro-life. Christians should be pro-life. Shame on Christians. And we see that, I don't want to get off topic, but shame on Christians that you are endorsing parties that are pro-abortion, that are pro-everything that the Word of God is against. So we're in trouble. So here, you know, here the Lord is showing us the most precious things on earth. He says, if you receive one of these children, you receive me. Why? Why? Well, because they are the church of tomorrow. They are the business people of tomorrow. They are maybe the politicians of tomorrow. So whenever you invest and pay attention to one of them or your kids, you're investing in two things, in the future of a nation and in the future of your children. You know, I, 
I tell my youngest, you know, he's school. My other two have finished school. But the, the one that is school now, I says, you know, two things you must have for, um, for uh, the future. And that is God and education, right? There's two things. Because if you have God, then you'll be able to know which direction God is going to lead you. And then, you know, I can add number three. Number three, we prepare them for where the world is going. Because I might not be here for them. So I have to sound the trumpet now. And I said, you know, especially to the young one, I said, let's say your mommy's gone, I'm gone, your grandparents are gone, and you have a family. And the whole world goes to hell. And then the church becomes an underground church. And then they come with a gun to kill your family and everything like that. And they said, you will live if you deny Christ. And I said, what would you say? What would you say? Where would your relationship with God be? What would, what would be the most important thing at that time? Would you give in and deny Christ just for you to live and your family to live? Or you will be like the persecuted church in Iran and other parts of the world where they are willing to lose their families in order not to deny Christ. And many die doing so. And we're in North America, we're so far from that. That's why I want to be like I want to have a commitment to God like the ones that are being persecuted because they have the true relationship and they have the true manifestation of God in their lives. Many of them say, don't give us democracy. Leave us in this hell because in this hell we are reaching millions to Christ and Christ comes to us. So let's go back. So, so we have to be careful here because... Um, I'm going to give you my thought and it's a very scary thing. So what happens, going back to what I said, you know, social media has overtaken it and social media has allowed us Christians and unchristians to neglect, say neglect, to neglect our children. Maybe, you know, the pressures of life, uh, pressures of work, pressures of pandemic, the uncertainties of the, where the world is. And then because of that, we're more caught up, more, um, more uh, what's the word, more overtaken by the uncertainties of the world that we neglect the very precious things that are available to us, our children, the next generation. So I believe that we have to have our priorities in place. I did a video uh, teaching uh, about a month ago you know, on the priorities of life. You know, you should go back there because, you know, it's God and family, right? So you have to put family in the right place in your life. So again, I'll say this, that whatever, whenever you invest in a child, in children, you're investing in their lives and you're investing in the future of where the world is going because the enemy is against you doing so because the goal of the enemy is to have a godless nation in the years to come. That's the reason that there is an attack upon us to have the truth. And because we have the truth, he doesn't want us to pass on that truth to our children, right? And then what happens, you know, he keeps us busy, he keeps us going through trials and tribulations that we neglect the very thing that is with us. And if you don't have kids, you have kids around your neighborhood, you can be doing a Bible study for them, you can be praying for them, you can do so much for them and the, ne and the, and the next generation. They are the next generation. So we need to create the future now how through our children you know so what happens if we don't you know <laughs> so this is where it gets scary so let, let, let's look at the at the um, 
at verse 6. He says, by whoever. So first he says, if you receive one of them, you receive me. And he said, by whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble and sin. Let's, let's be careful here. So, so whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble and sin by leading him away from who, from what? From my teachings. It will be better for him to have a heavy millstone as large as one turned by a donkey hang around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. You know, this is very important because this is something that we don't really preach in churches. And sometimes we're not aware. So uh, as I'm talking here to you today, you know, we have to understand that the most precious thing to Christ here, that's the a, that's a reason that another portion of Scripture says, suffer the little children to come unto me. God has a special heart for children. Why? Because they are the future. So he looks after the present, the adults, to he invests in them to save, equip, and we as a body, we need to disciple, we need to teach them the priorities of life and all of that, and then we got to teach this generation, the older ones, my age and younger and older, that, that they have to look after the next generation. So if they want a better world, if we want a better world, we got to invest in our children. But over here he says, he says, but if anybody, listen, this is very important. If anybody causes one of these little children to stumble, okay, the ones that believe in me. So that means that a lot of Christians, we, and a lot of religious people, you know, they take their kids to church, and a lot of kids probably believe in God, right? But then he's, the scary part is this, but if you lead them away from my teachings, if you lead them away from my teachings, that means anything that is contrary to the Word of God. And we're doing that today. Pulpits are doing that. Leaders are doing that. Governments are doing that. You know, they, if you ask Canada, U.S., if they believe in God, most of them, they'll say yes. Okay? That they were maybe part of uh, different denominations whether it be Catholic, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Evangelical, Baptist, Pentecostals, and the list goes on and on and on. If you ask, if you ask in Canada, the majority would tell you, yes, we believe in God. We believe in Jesus. You know, we go to their funerals, we go to uh, Christmas, and we go here and we pray whenever we need God. <laughs> right? So we have a believing, the majority of our North America is a believing country. Okay, so what happens is, is that over here, this is, this is very scary, and I want to explain it to you right, because we need to be aware, and I hope that, that our lives change towards our children, okay, or the children around us. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me, he doesn't say who sold out to me, he doesn't say that he's a prophet. No, whoever believes in me, to stumble and sin. How? By leading him away from my teachings. Listen, please listen. And drinking South America mate. It's a wonderful tea. Whoever, I'll read it again because I want to bring the point across and you got to pay attention and you got to give me time. He says, by leading him away from my teachings, if we cause them to stumble and sin. So how do we do that? How do we cause um, these children to sin, to stumble, and we keep them away from God's teaching? Well, let's look at governments. Let's look at governments. Let's start with that, and then we'll go to the church, and then we'll go to you. So governments right now, they're fighting for wrong educations. Then we're fighting for 
pro-life or abortions. So they are they are fighting to make their lives better according to what they what they see today. But I don't think they're thinking about their tomorrows. You know, I don't think they're thinking. You know, I mean, I like to talk to the politicians that are going in the wrong directions. And I says, do you have kids? Oh, yeah, we have kids. We have grandkids as well. We have many kids in our family. I says, and, and you know, where is your head? Where is your brain, sir, or man? Where is it? I mean, the things that you're trying to do, you're trying to create a worse world for them. So where in the world is your love for your children and your grandchildren? Now you know where I'm going. So what happens, they, they you know, they, 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 they go into a party and the party is, they have the rules, well, we're pro-life or we're pro-abortion, we're pro-LGBTQ and we're not, and we do this and we, you know, so they have uh, rules and, uh, and what, what, is, what is good for the party, right? And then when we vote, we, we vote and we look at what they stand for. And then we, um, we vote for the one that is probably closest to the ones that we believe in, right? And that's the way people should vote. 50% uh, of the people don't vote like that. They vote because they like the person and that's it, right? Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, they buy, uh, they buy Chrysler cars the whole life. You know, they will never go buy a Ford or they will never buy an import because their families always bought Chrysler or Ford or whatever or GM. And, you know, that's the way people are. So, you know, the people say, okay, well, we'll vote for this party for the rest of our lives because my parents were like that. My parents, my grandparents always voted for that. But we failed to see what they stand for. So what happens when we, as governments, Okay, I say we, uh, as the governments, they go for these things. Let's ask, do you think that they're thinking about the future of the next generation? I don't think so. I don't think so. They're thinking about, they only have four years, right, in their, in their term, maybe eight, but let's say four years. So they're thinking about what? Four years, right? You hardly will find a politician that thinks long-term, and they are there. I'm not going to mention any of them, but, but what happens, they think short-term, four years. And they're not thinking, you know, they don't get together as a government and they said, okay, you know, let's sit down and see what's going to be best for the next generation. When we move away from, I mean, when we, when we die, what, what are we going to live for our kids? What are we going to live for our grandkids? What are we going to live for them? What impact are we going to do with them? They don't think about that. So those that think wrongly in the decisions of a government, what we're doing, what they're doing, and that's the reason that it's so important to vote for the right parties and to have God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is because we want these entities and uh, to uh, think about the next generation, which they don't. I think about the next generation. I have three wonderful boys, you know, and I'm concerned, you know. I says, Lord, I don't want to die right now, you know. I want to be an influence to them. I want to protect them, you know. I want to I wanna, I wanna be there for them when they get married and they have kids and they have trouble and they have situations. You know, I want to be there for them because that's the next generation. So I want, I want to do it until the end, but I'm thinking the next generation. Governments are now thinking about next generation. They're thinking about their four years. So do we need to pray for the government? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we got to pray hard that whatever laws they give us, whatever decisions they make, that God will open up their eyes to think about that the decisions that they make, it will affect their children. Do you think that our government today think about their children? They don't. They're thinking about how am I going to look good and how am I going to do this and how am I going to do that and who knows the dirty deals that they're doing behind. But the last people that, 
that, that they're thinking of is their own kids and the next generation. So that's why we have to pray wisely so that way God can hear us because Jesus said, if you, if you pray according to my will, I hear you. So it's good for us to know knowledge, insight into how the world really is and they're not receiving. He says, whoever receives and welcomes one of these little child, but whoever causes one of these children to stumble and sin, and teach them a different thing. You, they, you know, it's, it's better. Let's let's read it. It says it's better for him to have a heavy millstone as large as one turned by a donkey hung around his neck and be drowned into the sea. So right now, the laws, governments are not thinking about the next generation, and there is punishment for that because they're not thinking about the very thing that is so precious to the heart of God, our children, right? So that's a hard one. But let's go to the pulpits now. Let's go to the pulpits, and then we're going to go to the pews, and then we're going to pray. So let's go to the pulpits now, okay? So are we at our pulpits putting our children our next generation in our plans, in our decisions? Are we understanding what this portion of the scripture tells us? That I'm sure that if we have Christian pulpits, I'm sure that their children are believers of God, of Christ. But again, the word to the pastors and to the leaders is the same word than to the governments and to the pews and to anybody that whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble and sin by leading him away from my teachings, it will be better for him to be hanged and thrown into the sea. So what is your point, Brother John? Uh, I'm glad you asked. Imagine those pulpits right now that have wrong gospels let's take that for example so what are they teaching their little children what they believe so if they believe in the wrong gospel they're teaching the children a wrong gospel so what happens the blind is leading creating the blind and leading the blind that they have created. But according to the word of God, God says, because you have the wrong gospel, then you are causing your children. Come on, let, let's take our mask off. You are causing your children to be led away from my teachings because you don't have the true gospel. So you have pulpits, with wrong gospel, teaching their children, their families, and the children of the church. <laughs> My God. My God. And the children of the church. We're teaching them. We're leading them away from God's teaching if we have the wrong doctrine and if we have the wrong teaching. So what are we doing? What are we investing in we invest in, in the next generation to be a generation with the wrong gospel. Okay? Then we have a lot of pulpits that are racist. Right? So imagine we have a gospel of racism. You know, they, they, they tell you that they're not racist, but they are. So what happens? Who are they going to influence from the pulpit? Everybody, right? Everybody that follows them. So what happens now, they're going to pass that on to whom? To their children. Monkey see, monkey do, monkey hear, monkey does. Right? So what happens then, we are, we are duplicating ourselves and we're giving wrong things to our children 
that are contrary to the teachings of Christ. Do you get me? So you see, it's one thing to pray about the next generation, but for us, we have to see what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong as parents, as pulpits, as governments. Are we neglecting children? Are we neglecting what's the most precious thing for God? Suffer the little children to come to me. That if you receive any of these little ones, you're receiving me. But if anyone causes one of these little children that believe in me to stumble and sin, leading them away from my teachings, he will be better than being hanged and thrown into the sea. It's tough. So what happens? So what are we teaching? You know, do we have a responsibility as parents? Absolutely. You know, I... I tell my, my, my boys the truth, right? You tell them the truth, and now they have to make a decision in their lives. But what I want to pass on, I want to pass on to what I believe is the correct gospel. And the correct gospel must, must, be, must be, number one, what Jesus said, repent. Not only believe, but repent. Repent from your ways and embrace God's ways. We have to give that message to our children. That's a preparation for them to realize and to understand that we need to, yes, we need to get baptized, we need to receive the Holy Spirit, but then we got to teach them that Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a holy church. For without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. So we can't force them but we got to tell them and teach them so that way we are not going against the teachings of Christ. So we have to teach them truth, not racism, not one world government, no pro-abortionists or pro whatever the word of God is against. Because if we teach that, you are doomed as a pastor, as a government, or, uh, uh, or as a Christian, you're doomed. According to the word of God, not according to me. You're doomed. Why? Because you are going against the teachings of Christ. And you are causing them to be in a wrong gospel. You are causing them, you're neglecting them probably. You're not teaching them the word of God. And for them to be ready for that day when Jesus comes, that it could be today, tomorrow, there is no age now when people die. They can die at 5, 6, 10, 20, 30, 50, 80, 100, 120. They can die at any age. Our job to pass on to our kids is for them to be ready for the bridegroom. That when he comes, the bride is ready. But how do we, how do we, how do we invest? How do we invest in the, in the next generation? Well, number one, we got to pray for the government that the government begins to think that whatever decisions they make, it will affect their children. That they will not think four years. That they will think lifetime. What world do we want to have tomorrow? The same thing with pastors and leaders, people of influence, people that teach the word and that. That if we don't have the right gospel, if we don't have the right teachings, then we're going to cause our children to stumble and sin. How? By teaching them teachings that are contrary to the word of God. It sounds good. Form of godliness, but not power. It sounds good. But we're teaching racism. We're teaching hatred. We're teaching what we are. That's the reason that the, the apostle said, be imitators of me as I'm of God. I mean, he put himself like that. He says, you know, do you want to get closer to God? Come and look at my life. Right? But he had the truth. So governments must have the truth. Pulpits might have the truth. And you, as a parent, 
you must have the truth. And you got to pass on. You can't force your kids to be whatever you want them to be. But you have the power, the authority, delegated authority by God to pass on the right gospel, the right way of thinking, not your way of thinking, God's way of thinking, unto them and then leaving them into the hands of the Lord for the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them and pray for them. That's the best thing as well that you can do for the next generation. But teach them. That's why the Bible says that, you know, when if you train a child in the, in the ways of the Lord, when he gets older, he will not depart from, from it. So that means that whatever we teach now, it will be there tomorrow. Right? So we have to do our part because the consequences are huge. Huge. And people don't preach this. You see, if we taught this, if we preached this in our churches and made it a priority to, to, to suffer the little children to come to us, and to pray for the next generation, pray for governments that whenever they make decisions, they will make it accordingly to the word of God and that they will think about tomorrow because their children will suffer the decisions that they make in their turn. And pulpits, I see that all the time. You know, the true callers come out and they have different gospels, whether it be gospels of prosperity or, or gospels of uh, convenience or, or gospels of social justice or, or gospels of, uh, of doctrines of devils and deceptions and stuff like that. I, 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 my heart breaks because of what those pulpits are passing on to their congregation, to their own children. That's where there is no fear of God. You know, I remember this lady and I had a picture of this lady. She was a tall, heavy set lady and she will come to our church many years ago and she will stand. She was an accountant. She likes control. And then she had a little girl, must have been 10 years old, little heavy set lady, young girl. And she will stand just like mama, <laughs> right? And sometimes we don't understand that as parents, as adults, what a huge influence we have to our children or to the children. That's why Sunday school for children, all of that is important. It's how we train them. More so for governments to make right decisions for a country that will affect positively to the next generations rather than negative because a lot of governments are trying to do the devil's work to create a godless nation. And if they uh, succeed in creating a godless nation, it will affect our children. So that's why whether you're religious or have a relationship with God, Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me. So before I pray, let's read this again. It says, whoever humbles himself like this little child will be the greatest in the kingdom. But whoever receives and welcomes one child like this one in my name receives me. Okay? This is the most precious thing to the heart of God. Children. Why? Because they are the next generation. So what legacy would you leave for the future of your nation, for the future of your city, for the future of, of Canada, for the future of your children, for the future of the children that you have influence? What legacy? What, what are you going to leave for them? Nothing? Are you going to teach them about God? Are you going to teach them the right teachings? Because we better teach him the right teaching. So I'm calling governments and I'm calling pastors and leaders. I'm calling parents and those that have influence over children to make sure that you have the right teachings. Why? Because listen to the word of the Lord. May those that have ears, let them hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church today. It says, by whoever, this is Jesus, this is the word of God. 
But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble and sin by leading them away from my teachings, it will be better for him. It will be better for that government. It will be better for that leader, that pastor. It will be better for that parent. It will be better for that for that person that has influence on the children. Listen, it will be better for them to have a heavy millstone as large as one turned by a donkey hung around his neck and to be drowned into the depths of the sea. He says that will be better of what they're going to receive. If they teach children, the next generation, if they cause them to stumble and sin. Do you hear? To stumble and sin. Leading them away from the teachings of Christ. We have to stop teaching our teachings that might be contrary to the Word of God. We as parents must make sure that our teaching is the correct gospel, it's the correct doctrine, it's the correct thing. It doesn't say here, you know, you, it doesn't say the Baptist teaching. It doesn't say the Lutheran teaching. It doesn't say the, the uh, Catholic teaching. It doesn't say the Pentecostal teaching. It doesn't say the Evangelical teaching. It doesn't say the Anglican teaching. He says, my teaching. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father. My teaching is me, Jesus said. He is the Word. So we have a responsibility for the young person. We have a responsibility as parents, as adults, as pastors, as governments to teach the next generation God's teaching, not the Baptist teaching, not the Pentecostal teaching, God's teaching. So now as parents, as governments, as puppets, we need to really make sure that we're not teaching the Baptist doctrine or the Pentecostal doctrine or the Lutheran doctrine or the Catholic doctrine but we're teaching them God's word God's teaching oh my God this is good stuff this needs to be preached in our churches my heart breaks when you go out there and I make many mistakes with my voice and I regret a lot of them but thank God that they're alive and I still have time to make things right with them and to adore them and to, and to love them. And you know, I'm a tough dad, but tough dads are good because we care a lot, we love a lot. And I thank God for the opportunity that I have as a father, as a parent in this hour. But we have a responsibility and we're gonna pray for the next generation and we're gonna pray in these three areas that we teach here. The word of God. And I hope that some governments are listening. <laughs> because whatever decisions you agree to that are contrary to the word of God, you are guilty of what this portion of scripture says. If you as a pre preacher, as a teacher of the word, where you have followers and you're teaching a contrary to the word of God, you're teaching your gospel or a different gospel, you're in trouble. And if you're a parent, a Christian parent, and you're teaching something that is different than the teaching of Christ, you're in trouble, right? So what is that going to do for us? Get to the Word of God, play safe, and teach Him. What would, what would I teach? What did I teach, let's say my youngest? God and education. The other two older ones, put God first. My prayer for them is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
That sums up everything. That's a good prayer for the for all their children. Because if they love God with all their hearts, then they're going to do things correctly. And they're going to love the Word because the Word is Jesus. So what else? Salvation. My, my firstborn comes to uh, my teachings. My middle one, he grew up when I was pastoring in my teachings. My youngest one, I have access to him because he lives with me and is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, repent. You can't go to number three unless you repent. You got to turn away from your ways and embrace God's word and God's way. Because when you repent, he purchases us with his blood. He cleanses us from all of our sins. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions and he remembers them no more. So he pays a price, but he takes ownership of our bodies. Now our bodies, they become the temple of who? Of the Holy Spirit that we're about to receive. So then number three, we need to get baptized. Baptism is not a symbol. Baptism is a thing that has meaning and is powerful. Why? Because the Bible teaches that when we go under the water, we bury the old self. And who is the old self? The old self is the one that was bound to the powers of the devil and the powers of sin. And you had no power over sin. The Bible says that you were slave to sin. So that means that you didn't have power. So, you know, don't feel bad about all the crazy stuff that you did in the past. You did it because you were a prisoner of the devil. You were a prisoner of sin. But when Jesus came and you repented of your sin, he forgives you. And then he says, now I got baptized in water. So now you got to get baptized in water. And when you got baptized in water, you bury the old self under the water and shut the door to the devil and tell the devil you are no longer a slave to sin but now you're a slave to righteousness and now you are born again you've been translated from darkness to the light now you belong to jesus and your boss is jesus and then you devil if you ever want peace of me deal with my lord and when I grow up in this new life, I'm going to come against you and make your life miserable in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be teaching. So when we go under the water, we put everything under the water and we shut the door for the devil. Then we, we come out of the water, we receive this new life that God has given us. He says, you know, I have come to give you life and more, life more abundant. So God has a purpose now for your life and for your family. And then he says, and now receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, God came upon them by His Spirit. In the New Testament, He says, I want to come in into you and make that my tabernacle, my body, my temple. Praise God. So I can help you in your everyday struggles. I can lead you because that spirit is a spirit of truth that will guide you to all truth and will tell you what is yet to come. And then I added number five. And that is, Jesus said, we're stopping right now. But it says, I'm coming back and we're going to stop again. So we have to teach ourselves and our children and those around us when we witness that Jesus Christ is coming back. To judge, he's coming back in the rapture. He's coming back, but he's coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle. A holy church, a righteous church, a church that is in right standing with God. A church that is holy, for without holiness, nobody's going to see the Lord. That's why we have to live ready. You see, a lot of people, you know, they go through the, the steps, they repent, they have all of that. And then they just begin to use their freedom to sin again. And we have a large percentage of believers that are doing so. Why? Because they're missing number five. 
that he's coming back and he can come back for you today. Are you ready if Jesus came for you today? Meaning, if today you took your last breath of life and you die. Will you die in righteousness? Would you be ready? Would you be doing all the good things that the Bible tells you so? Or are you in rebellion of the word? Or are you backsliding? Or are you in sin? And you will probably maybe miss it. This is the day the Bible says, today is the day of salvation and today is the day as well to come back to God and return to our Father and to say, Lord, forgive me for my ways, forgive me for my sins. Be Lord of my life and help me with my struggles. That's right, that's a good prayer. And help me with my struggles. Forgive me for crucifying you over again. Forgive me for putting sin before you. Forgive me because I thought that I loved you, but I didn't. Help me as I draw closer to you. Help me to love you even more. And I know that as, there, as I draw closer to you, you will draw closer to me. But I will have to cleanse my hands, my sinning life, as, the, as your word tells me so. So, Father God, help me to be ready today. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer of coming back to God and that, write me. Brother John at RevivalHour.ca. You know, I mean, write me. Or follow us on Facebook at this page. Or follow us on YouTube. If you press, if you click Revival Hour Ministries, pages will come up. And there is one name that says John with a capital A. Click on that. Subscribe to our channel. And there should be a little bell there. Click on that bell. So every time that we load up a program, you're there. But I'd love to hear from you. You know, lately, I've been hearing from different people everywhere, different denominations. You know, I'm praying for them. You know, lovely people from Ecuador, uh, Janine and her daughter, Julia, and, uh, and, and others that are calling me. I mean, and, uh, and, they're, and they're, you know, anonymous prayers, you know, a lady that wrote today, and I, and I pray for her, and then and we're going to left us prayer requests, and many others. So you never know who we're touching. But when we go to heaven, we'll know who we touched. The main thing, don't fight the truth of the Word of God, because then it will be worse than doing what I spoke tonight, today. So let's pray. Father God, right now we commit this teaching into, into our hearts that you will minister to us by your Spirit, that you will confirm it that it's from you, that we will be like the Vereans searching the Word of God to make sure that we understand this portion of the Scripture in Matthew 18, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we're going to pray for three things the governments of the world, the government of our nation. Father, that they have kids, they have grandkids, and they don't realize that the decisions that they're making, it will affect their kids and their grandkids because they're thinking only, what can we do in four years? And I'm sure that they're thinking more about themselves than their children and hoping that the world will just be whatever it will be but they're not thinking about the children. I pray, Father, that you will give this nation politicians that will be aware of the children and the next generation in the name of Jesus Christ, that there will not be governments that will think about themselves, but that they will think of the influence that they have into the future and the next generation. My God, in the name of Jesus Christ. So we pray your blessing upon them. And I pray, Father, that the fear of God will come into their lives, O oh God, especially the religious and even those that know Christ. O oh God, I pray, God, that you will make that so vividly. Because in this hour, Father, there is a battle, there is a war against Christianity, against the, the standing uh, for God. 
as we see it in the U.S. now. So, Father, be with our governments. Be with the U.S. as well. Father, that, Lord, that they will think about the future of the next generation of our children, Father God. Number two, Father, we pray for pulpits, pulpits that have wrong doctrines, pulpits that teach their children things that are contrary to your teachings. Oh, Father, have mercy upon those pulpits, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that you will protect their children and their children that they have influence to in their congregations or in their ministry, O oh God, that they will not teach a denomination doctrine. They will not teach uh, uh, their own thinking or racism. I see that so much, oh God, racism and, and all of that. So Father God, protect their children, protect the children of the churches, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And open up their eyes, Father. Many times has been prophesied, Lord, that you will raise up young children to know you and to preach and all of that. I pray, God, that you will protect them from wrong gospels and wrong teachings and racism and hatred and, and all of those things that can divide, oh God, that they become a duplicate of what the parents are or what the pastors are in the name of Jesus Christ. So Father, shake the pulpits and put the fear of God that if they, if they cause any of these little ones to stumble or sin by teaching them what is contrary to the word of God, let them know the consequences that it will be better for, it will be better that they put a rope around their neck and be thrown into the sea. Oh, Father, have mercy. And Father, as parents, as uh, Sunday school teachers, as those that have influence of the young people, I pray to God that we will all understand from governments and pulpits to parents and to and to Sunday school teachers and those that have influence with children, that we will all understand that when we invest in a child, we're not only investing in a child, but we're investing in the next generation. We're investing in the future of our nation. We're investing in the future of our cities in the name of Jesus Christ. So Father God, help us to pray wisely Oh God, and according to the word of God, Lord, thank you that you love the children. Lord, we pray for our children. Lord, I pray for my Joshua, Taylor, and John. Keep your hands upon them. Oh God, that they will know you, that they will, they will, Lord, that they will do great exploits for you. And Father, for all the children of all those that are listening to us, oh God, be with them, Father. Lord, that they will all love you above everything else, that they will love you with all their heart, mind, and soul. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, those that are backsliding, bring them back. Those, Lord, that have been taught wrongly, Father, that, Lord, that we will teach what is right. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that we will not teach a form of godliness, that we will not teach a gospel that is lukewarm or, or a wrong gospel. But Father, God, that we will go to your word, and even if we have to ask for forgiveness to our children, which I have many times with my boys, oh God, I pray that many of us will continue to do so. And Father, that Lord, that they will be precious to us as they are precious to God. So we commit the children of this nation into your hands. We commit the children of this world into your hands. Watch over them. Keep them in the right path. I pray, Father, that you will fill them with the Holy Spirit, O oh God. For the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth that will guide them to all truth and will tell them what is yet to come. O oh God, protect the children and the next generation. And Father, <clears throat> destroy the works of the devil that comes against this generation, social media and gaming and all of the things that have come against them. Father, destroy that in the name of Jesus Christ and have your way. O oh God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. And bless the parents, bless the grandparents, bless the pastors, bless the government, those that have influence upon the children. Lord, that they will make the right decisions. And Lord, that they will read Matthew 18. And that they may have the fear of God in the decisions that they make for the future of this nation, for the future of church, and the future of our cities, 
and the future of our home. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen and amen. Praise God. Wow, that was a beautiful angle, how the Holy Spirit brought it forth. Government, pulpits, parents, Sunday school teachers, and those that have influence with children. That is our next generation. And we got to pray that God will destroy the works of the devil upon our children. So may the Lord bless you. Uh, we're going to continue to pray for you. We're looking at ways how to expand our social media, our teaching on the, on the, I don't think I'll be able to do it every day, but we'll see how the Lord leads because we need to hear. But I encourage you to follow us on uh, Facebook and to uh, follow us on uh, YouTube as well. And if you're not part of our ministry and you want to send us a gift, just uh, write us to uh, Brother John on Revival Hour. Give us your prayer request and send us a gift so we can further what we're doing and letting this word go forth in power. In Jesus' holy and precious name. This is Brother John from Revival Hour. And guess what? We're fighting for you. Amen. God bless you. And we'll see you tomorrow. It's the last day. It's the last day of the month and we'll be talking about the resentment, bitterness, the power of forgiveness and so on. Things that bind us and cripple us. See you tomorrow. Bye for now.